Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the discrete Fourier transform. This is sort of a continuation of the last lecture where we talked about the continuous Fourier transform. And this is important. This is one of the cornerstones of audio signal processing. On the other hand, it's also kind of some fiddly math. This will be a short lecture, but it'll be kind of intense. Feel free to pause, look stuff up, go back, that kind of thing as we look at it. Anyway, I hope everyone's doing well, and let's dive into this fancy topic. So, the um, if you remember last time when we finished, we had this. We had the... Uh, equation representing the an integral here that was representing the continuous time Fourier transform which took a time domain signal and converted it to a frequency domain signal now in the last thing there, there wasn't this W there was an infinity and one of the first things we want to do is not integrate from minus infinity to infinity because that's a long time and I don't know how to do it so instead I'm gonna say well you know we can think of this as sort of a limit that we sort of, as some number w gets larger and larger, this will be a closer and closer approximation to the uh, to the true value. And so let's think about that. And the idea here, the first idea, the first trick we're gonna use is that as w gets bigger, we'll get a pretty good approximation. And so we'll keep w finite somehow. Now, the next trick is to say, well, that's great, but if we look at what this integral is doing as w gets large, let's say that our time domain signal f of t has some maximal period p that sort of after that it repeats. It's really infinitely repeating in time but I could really cut out a chunk of it and say, oh yeah, 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 it's just a bunch of copies of this. And if I cut out a chunk like that, um, I have no idea how the camera works, then I can sort of uh, take that chunk and just integrate over that. And all that's gonna do is change the absolute amplitude on the left, it's not gonna change the relative amplitude. So instead, let's just integrate from zero to the period. Well, how do we know what the period is? We don't. So again, we'll want to make sure that we make p be as large as we can sort of stand computationally because we want to be able to capture signals with very long periods. Now notice that signals with very long periods correspond to very low frequencies. And a lot of times we just don't care about the signal uh, components that are below some minimum frequency. And so this is probably an okay thing to do. Now, the pro next problem is that this f of t isn't a thing we have, right? We have a bunch of discrete samples. We don't even have a continuous time signal. And so we might sort of reasonably ask, well, what happens if we sort of treat the signal as zero notionally everywhere except at those discrete time points we've sampled? Well, then this f of t becomes sort of a sequence of samples, x of sub n, and what we're gonna do is just take a chunk of samples, capital N of them, and we're gonna turn that integral into a sum because it's zero outside the points where it isn't. And now our thing, we're gonna just compute at discrete frequencies. This K here is going to be some notion of a particular integral frequency that we wanna compute the amplitude, the, you know, the power of. And so, now we've got a sum. Now we've got a thing that says, well, to compute a the power at a particular frequency k, we just sum all the samples up, but we weight each sample by this factor, where this thing now, this thing that was t up here before is now sort of little n over big n. It's sort of the fraction through the period that we are. And that is the discrete Fourier transform. That's all there is to it, is we just compute this sum now, if we want to compute for all the sort of integer frequencies k, there's going to be sort of a doubly nested loop here. We'll, we'll run this same computation for each k. Okay, that's a thing a computer can do. It can run these computations really fast. I mean, it involves complex numbers, which is a bit of a pain in the neck because computers don't really like 
complex numbers very much, but your language might have them. And if it doesn't, you can certainly simulate them by just carrying around the real part and the imaginary part yourself. And so what we'll get out here is a bunch of complex frequencies at various k's, and that will be our frequency domain representation of the time domain signal. Now, just like with the continuous transformation, time transformation, you probably want to be able to go the other way too. If I have a bunch of bins representing the power at various frequencies, I'd like to get back to a time domain signal. And the story here is exactly the same as with the continuous time case. We, we change this minus, we get rid of this minus sign and we divide by one over two pi because radians. And now we have our time domain signal back, except there's this funny factor of one over n. I'll talk about that in a bit. So I can now freely convert between time domain PCM and sort of frequency domain bins. I can take that frequency domain representation of a repeating signal and I can uh, turn it back into a um, time domain um, representation of the repeating signal and everybody's happy. No, no, yeah, the X's are still complex, right? The, when I've got the answer here, what I'm gonna get out is a complex number representing a frequency. And just like in the continuous case, I'm probably interested in the magnitude of that complex number, the absolute value, right? So that same computation applies if I wanna get the actual power. And then I can get the phase with an arc tangent just like I did before. Um, notice that the inverse is really only computed as the sum of discrete frequencies. And so we're gonna lose information here, right? We lose sort of all those, you know, we lose some amplitude at all those frequencies that are between two bins. Uh, and so when I do this transformation of the frequency domain and back to the time domain, I can't expect to have sort of a perfect result. But as the number of bins increase, the result gets pretty good. When I was a child, I, you know, doing a 128 point or 256 point DFT was considered sort of normal sized or maybe even big and 512 was very big. And now 4K DFTs are a thing. Um, so as we talk later, we'll see some of what hap made that happen. But a lot of what made it happen is computers have just gotten fast, crazily fast. Now I mentioned the N earlier. Uh, I'm sort of following Wikipedia with the way I'm writing this out. The thing is that when I compute one of these bins, I'm summing a bunch of amplitudes. And so sort of notionally, this power is sort of n times something. So if you're, if you're trying to compute absolute power x, you gotta watch out for whether you need a one over n up here or not. Certainly, it's a constant factor that scaled the same across all the bins. So relatively, the bins are all gonna be the same relative height. But, you know, the, the complex numbers are gonna be just scaled. But, of course, if, you're try, if you care about absolute rather than relative, you gotta be careful of that. It, to get the original signal back, we put the one over n here. And so we sort of scale the bins back down before we try to turn it into a time domain sequence again. Um, this math is kind of hard, it's kind of fiddly, there's a lot to screw up with it. So you can sort of see that you can easily screw up minus signs, that sort of thing. If you don't have a complex number representation, it gets to be even more fun. Um, it's easy to forget a two pi somewhere or something like that, but it's all doable. It's all well within, uh, you know, your ability to write a computer program to solve it. The next thing to notice is that the frequency resolution is a function of the sampled period. Sort of the more that the, the bigger a, a time domain sample you do, sort of the closer together these X sub Ks, these frequency bins that come out are. And, um, and so with narrow bins like that, uh, you get a more precise answer. And so we generally like to do our FFTs sort of as large as we reasonably can so that we get that um, resolution up there. The, you know, the way it works out in practice is that, you know, if I have, a, you know, about a 48K 
sample per second signal, a 48 times 1024 sample per second um, signal, and I do a 1024 point DFT on it, then I uh, get out about 24 hertz of signal per bin. So that's the resolution of those bins. Next lecture, I'll talk about something called windowing. One of the problems with uh, the DFT that can bite you is that this thing sort of, if you go back clear back up here where we made this approximation, we sort of assumed that we had got the start and end of a period exactly. If we haven't, well, you know, sort of this integral and therefore this sum treats the signal as cyclic. And so if I have sort of part, if, if I have sort of part of an iteration, if I, my sine wave goes down and up and then stops down here somewhere, well, that's going to look like, you know, in this sort of infinite representation, a sharp edge in the signal. And sharp edges correspond to noise. So that's going to be a problem. And that's something we'll talk about next time. So that's the DFT. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And it's something that, you know, if this were a signal processing course, I'd send you all off to implement it now but it isn't. If this were an algorithms course, we'd jump right into the interesting algorithm that is the fast Fourier transform. But really, this is a lot of what you need to know, is that this is the equation that converts your, uh, and really the computer program, that converts your time domain signal into a frequency domain signal. And that's, that's cool. That's a cool thing to be able to do. So that's what I've got this time. Next time, we'll talk about some of the implications and applications of all this. Uh, Thanks for listening. Like I say, I hope you're doing well out there, and I will talk to you again soon.